border battle. President Trump and Democrats fight over funding for the wall. How the skirmish affects Catholic aid groups. Threat from Tehran. Why the Secretary of State issues a warning about developments in Iran. Vatican shakeup. Pope Francis drops three cardinals among his most trusted advisors. We have a report from Rome. And a real watchdog. A house destroyed by the California wildfire, but not everything is lost. On EWTN News Nightly for Wednesday, December 12th, 2018. Good evening from Washington, D.C., and thank you to those of you joining us from around the world for news from a Catholic perspective. I'm Lauren Ashburn. President Trump's former personal lawyer is headed to prison. Michael Cohen was sentenced to three years today in New York. The 52-year-old was found guilty of several crimes, including lying about the president's business dealings in Russia. Cohen says his blind loyalty to President Trump led him down a path of darkness. He will begin his sentence in March. A day after a tense meeting with Democrats, President Trump continues his fight to strengthen America's borders, even if it means a government shutdown. His Twitter comments are escalating tensions with congressional Democrats. White House correspondent Mark Irons reports. Good evening, Mark. Good evening, Lauren. Today I talked to a senior White House official and a representative of the U.S. bishops about the debate. The clock is ticking for President Trump and lawmakers. They face a December 21st deadline to figure out government funding. President Trump is speaking out. He weighed in again today on Twitter, writing, the Democrats and President Obama gave Iran $150 billion and got nothing, but they can't give $5 billion for national security and a wall. The president is wise and he says what he wants to and what he means. I met Kevin Hassett outside the West Wing of the White House, but the president's economic advisor didn't want to discuss the financial impact of shutting down the government. I'm not going to talk about the shutdown stuff right negative? now. There's an active negotiation going on. Today, the president called on Democratic leaders to, quote, give us the votes to get additional border security. The bishops absolutely recognize the right of nations to secure their borders. That's a very important right. Ashley Feasley is policy director in the Migration Office for the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. She tells me rights come with responsibility, and the $5 billion President Trump is demanding could go to more than a wall. It's a lot of money that's been asked for this, and there are certainly other things that can also help improve security in a humane way to address some of the vulnerable people that are coming across the border today. The Catholic Catechism offers additional insight. Section 2241 says the more prosperous nations are obliged to the extent they are able to welcome the foreigner in search of the security and the means of livelihood, which he cannot find in his country of origin. But it adds, immigrants are obliged to respect with gratitude the material and spiritual heritage of the country that receives them to obey its laws and to assist in carrying civic burdens. Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer says Americans will suffer needlessly if President Trump follows through on his threat to shut down parts of the government. Democrats say they've given the president two options to keep the government open, but the wall remains the sticking point. Lauren. What happens if the two sides don't reach a deal before the December 21st deadline? About one quarter of the government would close down. Now that includes the Departments of Justice, State, Homeland Security, Transportation and Agriculture. In addition, national parks would all see non-essential services stop. Lauren. And that means no salaries too. White House correspondent Mark Irons. Thank you, Mark. Joining me now is Representative Andy Biggs, Republican from Arizona. Congressman Biggs is a member of the House Judiciary Committee and the House Freedom Caucus. Congressman Biggs, welcome to our broadcast. Thanks, Lauren. Good to be with you. President Trump said yesterday in a televised debate that he is going to shut down the government if he doesn't get the funding he wants for the border wall. The time is running out. You are a big border wall supporter, and I have a bill here that you support, the Fund and Complete the Border Wall Act. You say... It is currently sitting with seven different committees. Are you frustrated that this bill has not moved forward, especially in a Republican-controlled Congress? I imagine you are. Yes, Lauren, that's exactly right. I am frustrated. Um, I spoke with the speaker um, before we even took the August recess. I asked him if he would hear it before the midterm election, and he said no, but we'll hear it right after. And now here we are 
what, uh, maybe five working days before the end of the term. We've actually gone beyond the term, but we're five days before we're supposed to end. My bill's still assigned to seven committees. We're still talking, but no action is happening. I'm extremely frustrated. I bet you are. One of your proposals, this is what I want to dig down into, because it, it, it's an interesting thought, is that for funding, you would penalize foreign aid to Mexico and other countries by $2,000 for every illegal alien that is apprehending, and then the funds that are withheld would be redirected to the border wall funding. The building, though, of the wall is $25 billion. Other estimates yes. are, are much higher, perhaps $70 billion. And given that the actual cost is unknown, how do you know that this proposal would actually cover the cost? That proposal is one of three I made to fund the, the wall. All three of them are needed to actually get to that $25 billion number. This is the least, uh, I don't want to say effective, but it, you, it would draw down the least amount of funds. But it would actually send something that I think is more important, and that's a strong signal to the folks that we are trying to help. I mean, we have spent uh, literally hundreds of millions of dollars over the last couple of years in Central America trying to help them with their problems so that we would not see so many people fleeing the, their country and coming up here and trying to enter illegally. That's the main reason for putting that in. Um, the, the actual real main funding of the wall would be taking, uh, imposing a small surcharge on uh, the massive amounts of uh, remittance payments that leave the country every year without taxation otherwise. And that would actually fund uh, that $25 billion over a period of uh, actually several years. The president is getting a lot of criticism today. I've seen clip after clip of him saying Mexico is going to pay for this wall and now the U.S. is going to pay for the wall and now we can't get the funding through Congress to pay for the wall. Where are we headed? Well, that's a fair criticism, but I, I do think if, if my, my bill was enacted, you would see other nations being paying for it, that, which is the why I would be paying for it, which is why I introduced it the way I did. Where we're headed now is um, a proposal that this be included in a, the spending bill that needs to pass next by the end of next Friday. That's where, that's where uh, it's being directed. Uh, it is a $25 billion uh, hit to the budget, exactly as you say. I think that needs to be needs to go. But one thing we do know is all the an analysis indicates to us that would actually that that wall would be uh, paying for itself over uh, actually a fairly short period of time, uh, with the reduction of the cost that we have imposed on our country through illegal uh, immigration. Thank you so much for your time and for explaining your proposals, Congressman Andy Biggs, Republican from Arizona. The Senate is set to vote on the largest criminal justice system reform bill in decades. It's a remarkable turnaround for a bill that has long been stalled. It could potentially give President Donald Trump a big bipartisan win. Capitol Hill correspondent Jason Calvi reports. Good evening, Jason. Lauren, good evening. This bill would give judges more flexibility when sentencing nonviolent criminals. It would lower mandatory minimums for some nonviolent federal drug crimes and reward prisoners for training. Catholic groups are voicing their support. With some federal agencies facing a possible shutdown next week, President Trump touts one issue where both parties can agree. Criminal justice reform, something that people have been trying to get, how long, Nancy? Many years, many, many years. Uh, looks like it's going to be passing, hopefully famous last words, on a very bipartisan way. Bipartisan, but not unanimous. Senator Tom Cotton, Republican from Arkansas, argues the law would amount to a jailbreak. To pass a sentencing leniency bill that will let thousands of violent, serious, and repeat felons out of prison within just weeks or months of it passing. I didn't campaign on that. The bill sponsor thanks both liberal and conservative groups for getting the bill to the Senate floor. We had to work to get the endorsement of, uh, you know, several organizations, but probably the biggest one in the country, the federal uh, fraternal order of police. So in the end, uh, we put this all together, and I think there was no way the leader could say no. David Safavian of the American Conservative Union says this bill will help offenders get back on their feet. The First act, Step Act creates incentives so that inmates take the time and do the hard work to improve themselves, whether that's with job skills, education, anger management, how to handle 
the rigors of family life. In a letter to senators, Catholic groups add their praise in particular because it would ban the shackling of pregnant prisoners. Catholics can disagree about justice reform. It's an issue the faithful can use their own prudential judgment to weigh. The Senate Majority Leader says he's moving the bill as soon as this week. Mitch McConnell warns his colleagues to get to work quickly or be prepared to work between Christmas and New Year's. Lauren? When I was talking to Representative Biggs, he said, let's move this thing along. I think it's time to go home for Christmas. So we'll see what happens. Capitol Hill correspondent Jason Calvi. Thank you, Jason. The House and Senate agree to establish new policies on sexual harassment. The Washington Post reports the deal will begin when the new Congress convenes in January. Included in the proposal, lawmakers will have to reimburse the Treasury Department for settlements related to harassment. A massive manhunt is on after a deadly shooting spree in one of Europe's most famous Christmas markets. The strike in Strasbourg. France left two dead and 13 others injured. Hundreds of police are searching for the suspected killer, a 29-year-old who yelled, God is great, in Arabic during the attack. Pope Francis has expressed his strong disapproval of the attack, disapproval of the attack, and expressed his compassion to all of those affected. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo asks the United Nations today to reimpose tough restrictions on Iran. Pompeo cites the Islamic Republic's refusal to comply with U.N. resolutions by testing ballistic missiles. Correspondent Wyatt Goolsby reports from the State Department. Good evening, Wyatt. Good evening, Lauren. In an address to the U.N., Secretary Pompeo laid out his concerns. He says Iran has done nothing to show it's complying with U.N. resolutions. Now Pompeo says the U.N. needs to push for stiffer penalties. When we collectively call upon Iran to cease its ballistic missile activity, we must agree to stop it now. But Iran is as defiant of the world's insistence as ever. Secretary Mike Pompeo made a special trip to New York today to address the UN Security Council. His biggest concern? Iran's testing of ballistic missiles capable of delivering nuclear weapons. Its suspected range also approaches 2,000 kilometers, which is far enough to target Athens, Sofia, Bucharest, and other major European cities. European countries agree that Iran must stop its missile testing and its wider support for terrorism in the Middle East. But most say they want to use the framework of the 2015 Iran nuclear deal, which the Trump administration rejects. The U.S. is worried about the government's rhetoric. The president has threatened to shut down the Strait of Hormuz, the passageway for nearly a third of all oil traded by sea. Iran's navy has acquired two new mini-submarines designed to launch missiles and torpedoes. For Catholics and other religious minorities in Iran, the threat of military conflict is the least of their worries. Outside of the four walls of any church, Christians face discrimination and don't have equal access to education, government programs, and the armed services. It's not unusual that Christians go missing or are killed for openly preaching the gospel. The State Department announced this week that Iran will remain on the list of countries of particular concern. That means officials here consider Iran to be one of the worst violators of religious freedom in the world, like imprisoning someone just for being a Christian. Now, some evangelical groups tell U.S. officials they are harassed and closely monitored by the government in Iran. Lauren? Correspondent Wyatt Goolsby reporting from the State Department. Thanks, Wyatt. British Prime Minister Theresa May survives a no-confidence vote from her own Conservative Party. I will contest that vote with everything I've got. Earlier in the day, she vowed to keep fighting. May was under fire over her plans for Britain to leave the European Union. Her opponents believed they finally had the opportunity to oust her from power, but fell short by a small amount of votes. Dozens of protesters held a rally in Myanmar's biggest city today to call for the release of two reporters. They were arrested one year ago and charged after reporting on the brutal crackdown on the Muslim Rohingya minority. Time magazine is honoring them, along with other journalists, as its person of the year. Pope Francis removes three cardinals from his informal cabinet as the group concludes its latest meeting at the Vatican. Cardinals George Pal of Australia, Javier Erzuriz of Chile, and Laurent Monsenguo Pasinha of Democratic Republic of Congo will no longer sit on the council. 
Pell and Erasuris are implicated in the sex abuse and cover-up scandal. The Holy Father thanked them all for their five years of service. Vatican correspondent Juliet Lindley joins us from Rome. Juliet, let's start with Cardinal Pell in Australia. We are hearing media reports that a verdict has been reached in the sex abuse trial of Cardinal George Pell. He is the highest ranked Vatican official to be charged with sex abuse, and that news is still under legal embargo by the Australian courts. Tell us what the Vatican is saying. Well, Lauren, the Vatican made no mention of the accusations against Pell in explaining his departure, and the Holy See says that it has the utmost respect for the Australian judiciary and would make no further comment. Now, there is a gag order on this trial. To be clear, there is no confirmation of a verdict. Pell took leave from his job as the Vatican's prefect for the economy to stand trial in the summer of 2017 in Australia on historic charges of sex abuse. He denies those charges. So while rumors are swirling, Lauren, we need to await the official statement from Absolutely. the Australian courts. Absolutely. As for Cardinal Pell and the other two cardinals who are being dropped from the Council of Cardinals, it's really not a surprise because their participation in the group's meetings has been very limited recently. Is there any indication from the Vatican if and when they will be replaced? Otherwise, the C9, as, it call, as it's called, will be the C6. Well, Lauren, the director of the Holy See press office, Greg Burke, gave reporters no indication this morning. He said no new nominations are foreseen for the moment, especially as the current members are finishing their work on the massive overhaul of the Roman Curia, which is the central government of the church. Now, just a reminder that Pope Francis created the Group of Nine in 2013 specifically to help him reform the Vatican. And as you say, it's not a surprise change has come. Cardinal Pell is dealing with his sex abuse trial in Australia. Cardinal Erasuriz is embroiled in the abuse crisis in Chile. And Cardinal Laura Monsengo is in poor health, as we know, Lauren. Which cardinals were there out of the nine? And tell us the key topics of discussion. So Cardinals Oscar Rodriguez Maradiaga of Honduras, Sean O'Malley of Boston, Reinhard Marx of Germany, Giuseppe Bertello of Italy, and Oswald Gracious of India, they all attended. And Vatican Secretary of State Cardinal Pietro Parolin was not present. But the Vatican says the Cardinals discussed the Clergy Abuse Summit that's coming up in February. And Cardinal Gracious is on the organizing committee of that meeting and may have shared his vision for the reform for reform within the group. Now, they also talked about the ongoing slashing of operating costs within the Roman Curia, the church's central government. Rather than letting any employees go, Lauren, it's more that early retirements, employee reshuffles, and hiring freezings are being implemented. By attrition, right. Juliet Lindley, EWTN News Nightly Vatican correspondent, thank you for your report. Thank you, Lauren. Stay with us. We have a lot more coming up on EWTN News Nightly. Troubling developments for Christian girls in Egypt. We'll be right back. <music> Women in the Western world spent much of 2018 focused on the Me Too movement. Yet a policy expert tells us a far worse kind of sexual abuse is happening in Egypt. In an article for the Jerusalem Post, Leela Gilbert writes, quote, Christian women in Egypt face kidnapping, rape, beatings, and torture. Innumerable girls and women vanish forever. And even if they are somehow rescued, their stories are thought to be so shameful that they're hidden as dark family secrets. And joining me now is that author, Leela Gilbert, adjunct, adjunct fellow at the Hudson Institute Center for Religious Freedom. Leela, thank you for coming in to talk about this important topic. Thank you very much for having me. You call this Egypt's silent epidemic, one that has been going on for years. Why do you think the kidnapping and the rapes of Egyptian Christian women are not receiving more attention? It's true in almost every country where Christians are being persecuted that this country doesn't pay much attention. Part of it's media exposure, which is why I'm very happy to talk to you, but also because people are very preoccupied and with such things as Me Too, when they really don't know how bad it is elsewhere. How do the fear and the shame felt by the victims and their families add to the silence on this issue? Well, it's very much a problem, especially in, in uh, minorities like Christians. We know now from the Nobel Prize that 
a woman was courageous enough to speak up about the rape and the abuse, sexual abuse, but it's not talked about. What do you mean from the Nobel Prize? The woman that won the Nobel Prize this year was a rape victim of ISIS and had been imprisoned for, for years by them and, and gang raped. She w went public with what happened to her. Egyptian President Abdel Fattah el-Sisi was elected in uh, May 2014 and endorsed by religious leaders, mm -hmm. including the Coptic Patriarch. Is President el-Sisi considered a Christian ally? If so, why is this happening? I think he has done more than any Egyptian president has ever done to try to befriend the Coptic community, which is 10% of his population. I think he has a sincere desire to reform Islam in Egypt. However, in the villages, in the little towns and the far-reaching areas, the mayor is a radical, the police chief is a radical. Some of them are complicit in plotting against these women. It's not just a matter of over, overlooking it. Plotting? Uh, plotting, yes. So I was going to ask, my next question was going to be, oh, well, what's being done? But if they're plotting, it doesn't sound like a lot's being done. Well, he has done a lot to support the Coptic community in terms of publicity and going to the Christian services on Easter and Christmas. He's done a lot, but I don't think anyone has control over every inch of his territory. And mob rule is really what's causing a lot of this. We should remind our audience that in Egypt, a person's religion is stated on their identity card, and in fact that there's a, a bill calling for that to be eliminated, um, but it failed in committee last month. What is the impact of that? It's always a problem when you are a minority in a, an Islamic, let's just be truthful, an Islamic uh, com country or community, you're always going to be discriminated against as far as education is concerned. There's always something you can't have, and there are things that happen to you and you can't be helped because nobody comes to your aid. And I don't want to give a, you know, to, to say that the president is doing everything in his power. I don't know that he is, but I think he's done more than a lot. It's just very bad there. Thank you so much for coming in, Leela Gilbert, to talk to us about an issue, you're right, we don't hear very much about. That's right. Up next, the Pope celebrates Mass on the Feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe, also an important day for EWTN. And a touching discovery for a woman who thought she lost everything in a California wildfire. On this day 38 years ago, wait for it, EWTN was formally established and incorporated by Mother Angelica. She flipped that switch. The network would launch on air eight months later. EWTN is the largest religious media network in the world, reaching more than 300 million television households in more than 145 countries and territories. Pope Francis urges the faithful to make service the focus of faith as he honors the patron of the Americas, the Virgin of Guadalupe. Sino por la capacidad de hacer que los otros sean protagonistas. The Holy Father speaking at a special mass for the Virgin in St. Peter's Basilica today. He said fancy words aren't necessarily to spread the faith. Rather, people should walk with others and hold each other up. Una preghiera breve. Audace. Earlier in the day, Pope Francis continued his series of talks, this on the Our Father. The Holy Father says God wants his children to address him directly and without fear, even about the pain we experience. Finally tonight, a woman returns to her home to find her dog waiting for her. It's not as easy as it sounds. Andrea Gaylord was forced to evacuate during the wildfire in Paradise, California. She came home this week after one month away, and look who was sitting right there, Madison. Here he is shown with his brother, Miguel. He kept watch over the house. An animal rescuer regularly checked on him and left him food and water. Gaylord praised Madison, especially his loyalty and patience. You know what they say here in Washington about politics, right? If you want a friend who's loyal, get a dog. <laughs> For all of us here at EWTN News Nightly, to all of you around the world, thank you for watching. I'm Lauren Ashburn. 
please keep in touch online. Follow me at Lauren Ashburn on Twitter and Lauren Ashburn EWTN on Facebook. Good night and God bless you.